What's up guys, it's EG, and today we're going to be starting a new series of videos called Distro Delves. In this series, we're going to be taking a look at various and different Linux distributions and later possibly just operating systems and comparing them to a baseline Linux distribution. And that baseline is Ubuntu 18.4 LTS. Why is Ubuntu 18.4 LTS the baseline? Well, it's simple. It's the most popular Linux distro on the server and desktop, and Canonical has the numbers to prove it. So, now is it the best Linux distribution? Probably not. But since it's ubiquitous, that's the distro we're using. And speaking of ubiquity, we'll be starting at the Ubuntu installer, which is simple, perhaps even dated, but very functional. From here, you can choose an install preset, normal or minimal, as well as choosing to install updates and or third-party software during the installation process. After selecting which device to install to, you choose a time zone and fill in the pertinent user information and then it's off to the races. Logging in for the first time greets you with a handy welcome app or screen or whatever you want to call it that shows you around the desktop, set up live patch, configure telemetry, and then we're ready to go. Now we're going to talk about functionality and usability. After about a minute or two, you're asked to update your system. The update is only 91 megabytes, which is modest in size, but I thought we already updated during the install. The update was quick and it didn't require a reboot, so that was nice. Next on the list is to install our display drivers and check for any firmware updates. There's a dedicated app for this where you can also toggle external repos and things, which is cool. There were a few different choices for my NVIDIA card, however the driver version 430 is the latest on offer, though it is not the latest driver available, which would be the NVIDIA 435 driver. Now you can easily install the latest NVIDIA driver via an external PPA or like repo, but that's outside the scope of this video. While the driver installation is happening in the background, let's briefly take a look at the default apps. The desktop environment is GNOME, and there are a couple games pre-installed, as well as the Libre Office suite, basic essentials like a calendar, calculator, media player, and web browsers, stuff like that. There's also a couple dev tools, such as Remia, which seems like an odd choice. There's also this utilities folder, which includes utilities like a log viewer, screenshot taker, and uh, an image viewer. That's a little odd to be considered a utility, but okay. The Ubuntu software app is the tool, or I guess app, that most desktop users will use to install apps, though you cannot find dev tools, frameworks, or libraries here. It supports snaps out of the box, and there's optional support for flat packs too. Now we're going to be taking a look at external media and removable drives. I've got this external USB drive with benchmarks and games installed on it. You can see that I just plugged the drive in and it pops right up in the file browser. I can open it and browse files and folders with no issues. However, I have a second internal SSD which is not showing up in the file browser. If we open GNOME Disks, you can see it here in the list. It has an encrypted volume and uses LVM. I can decrypt the volume, but I can't mount the file system, possibly because LVM support is missing by default. I'm able to mount other volumes on the drive though. Now let's take a look at third-party app support. I've got a set of core apps that I install on every system I use. Since Ubuntu supports snaps out of the box, all but one of my core apps can be installed straight from the software center. Unfortunately, Lutris, which is a super handy game slash app launcher, is not available through Snap, and I need to run a separate terminal command to install it. It's worth pointing out that flat packs work on Ubuntu, but you have to install the flat pack package first. Also, app images are somewhat supported, but you need to make the app image executable first. Otherwise, the file browser won't know what to do with them. Alright, on to the next section, network discovery. Here we're going to be looking at a few things dealing with how the Linux distribution discovers resources on the network, starting with file sharing. Linux is pretty cool in that you can share files with other systems in dozens of different ways. However, if you want to share your files with any computer on the network, be it Linux, Mac OS, or Windows, you'll want to set up something called Samba. As you can see, setting up Samba in Ubuntu is super friggin' easy. You can set up everything straight from the file manager, and you don't need to restart your computer or anything. In other locations, I can see this computer, as well as my workstation, which is running Manjaro, a totally different distribution of Linux. And here you can see that when I enable file sharing on my Mac, it pops up in the list. 
And last, I want to try to find my printer on the network. You see I'm able to find it, but it says does not accept jobs. Until it suddenly does. But I can't seem to figure out how to print a test page. I'm not sure if I consider this a success or a fail, but the printer does show up on the list and it eventually said it accepts jobs, so I'll take it. And at last, we're going to be taking a look at some benchmark metrics. First, we'll look at the startup times provided by System D, and we can see that we reached the desktop after 22 seconds after startup, with a total startup time of just under 38 seconds. These numbers don't mean much without something to compare it against, so we'll revisit these numbers in future videos. Same can be said about resource consumption. I'm using a tool called HTOP as well as the built-in GNOME resource monitor because, as you can see, they report different numbers. We can round up the memory consumption to below one gigabyte at idle. For CPU usage, there's not a super good way of measuring it, but we can look at the load average metric, which basically tells us that the load has increased over 15 minutes, which isn't surprising, but we also have 63 tasks running. I see that many of those tasks are for things like Evolution, which is a mail and calendar service, GVFS, which is used for mounting volumes and things, and something called XDG, which deals with application permissions. Again, these metrics don't mean a whole lot without something to compare them to, so we'll save these and use them in future videos. Comparing benchmarks is a core piece to the series, and for that I'm going to be using a tool called Geekbench 5. I ran through a standard benchmark, which you can check out with a link in the description, and the numbers are quite unimpressive. However, it does not matter because we're going to be using these numbers to compare against other distros later in the series. We're not testing the hardware in this series, we're testing the distro. And very last on the list is gaming benchmarks. So if you couldn't already tell from the Geekbench benchmark, this computer is not a powerhouse. The CPU is a notorious AMD A-series processor, and the GPU is an NVIDIA GT730 from 2014. As unimpressive as this rig is on paper, I'll be sticking with it for the rest of the season of Distro Delves. That being said, I thought it apt to benchmark some games from around 2014, starting with Grand Theft Auto V, which was released in 2013. Amazingly, this little GT730 did quite well, averaging just over 30 FPS throughout the benchmark. Keep in mind that GTA V is a Windows game played through Proton and Steam, which in turn uses Vulkan instead of OpenGL, which helps explain the surprisingly high frame rate. Next we'll be looking at another game from 2013, Tomb Raider. Unlike GTA V, Tomb Raider is a native Linux game ported by Feral Interactive and uses OpenGL instead of Vulkan. And, just like GTA V, Tomb Raider averaged just over 30 FPS during the benchmark. Next up, we'll take a look at numbers for CSGO, which was released in 2012. Despite using OpenGL, CSGO is highly optimized on Linux, and this little GT730 was able to pull out over 50 frames a second with the graphics settings on full blast. Not too shabby. The last benchmark on the list is not so much a game, but a synthetic benchmark. It's UniEngine Valley released in 2013. The FPS for this was terrible, at just under 14 frames a second. If this were a game, it would be totally unplayable. And with that benchmark, we're at the end of episode 1 of Distro Delves. Now I'm planning one episode a month with the season resetting in January of next year. Each season I'll tweak the test rig and test methodology as I figure out what works and what doesn't. Despite the name being Distro Delves, I also want to look at other operating systems too, so this isn't just another Linux video series. And as a reminder for the series, I'm not ranking or scoring distros, I'm just testing them. And we're specifically looking at the distro's performance, not the hardware. The test rig is unimpressive to say the least, but it doesn't matter because we're using those numbers to compare with other distros. So I hope you liked the video, and if you did, be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. You can follow me over on Twitter, check me out over on Coffee, and support me on Patreon. I hope that you guys like the series, and I appreciate everyone's support. And as always, thanks for watching.